So I'm going to talk to you about how the dynamics are going to be during this sharing. First, we're going to participate uh, different people that are here uh, in the Camalache, one-on-one, -on -one. the microphones, your microphones are going to be shut right now in, in this process. And if you like, and you have any questions or something that you're that you have questions in that moment, you can do that through the chat in Zoom. Then we're going to give some time so you can so we can respond to those questions. Our participations are going to be continuous. So please, it is, this is very important. Uh, do your do make your questions. So then we are going to have a time like 10 minutes after all of the sharings of here in Cambalache. So we can select some questions and can respond them. So please, uh, if you have, you also want to be part of the um, our network, our network of email listing, you can uh, write to us on an email and or make us know that you want to be in this list, email list of information of the Camalache, you can tell us so we can put you in, in that email list. So just remember that the questions are going to be uh, by chat, by the Zoom chat, Zoom chat, that you can do that question there. So please, we ask you if you do, you make the questions by the chat in the Zoom. So then we're going to, uh, going to welcome Rami. That's, she's going to talk to us about uh, the context in which we are. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good night. Good, good day. I want to thank everybody that's, that's on the other side, because in this meeting, we are in, from different parts of the world. Here, uh, we are also uh, various people here. So thank you so much for your time, for your attention. I'm going to talk to you about this project, the Cambalache, that is here where, where we are right now. Uh, it's like the seed of this is that what's what's happening here in the workshops. Cambalache is a project that nowadays we uh, it's formed by eight women very diverse women from different histories, ages, nationalities, experiences, life experiences. Uh, but we are united by the idea of change and putting in practice these methods. The project uh, works as a community uh, in exchanging community of things, knowledge, and mutual support. In this space is where is where these exchanges are are done right here behind me uh, we can see different things that we have here and we have like exchanges of of things of knowledge and of mutual support so it has 10 years and three years ago the department of decolonial economies uh, has started and Tito and Aldo integrated in that department. You're going to be able to listen and, and know them in a little bit. But in this uh, decolonial economy department, uh, this ideas of these workshops is, is born. At the beginning, there were, uh, there were the people came here, they were physical. <laughs> They were one week and like, like now we are meeting people of all around the world. In those workshops, people came here to Camalache from all around the world to, sh to share in these workshops. These workshops are, are a way of financing the, financing the pro, uh, project of Camalache. And, and the idea came from our, our desire to share these methods that we put in practice here in this space for the world. And I wanted to tell you also about the context because it's very important to know that in which space and in what, which situation this, this territory is, was born in. We are in the southeast Mexico, in San Cristóbal de las Casas, uh, Chiapas, Mexico. Historically, this territory, after colonization, has a, a, 
a history of struggles that are very important that have been periodical and have been continuous maybe you know much of them because of the oppressions of, uh, because of this discrimination racism and corruption a uh, few access to money exploitation the reality in which we live here in mexico and in south is is, is like that is that's the, the situation but this reality also has taken us and since taking the people here to put in practice all these other ways and to rescue the methods that are not new at all that we always say we try to remember this all the time that all these ways that we're going to see nowadays that are methods and, and practices that are very ancient that have been here a long, long time ago. And we want to visibilize them and put them in practice again. I believe that that would be all. Right now, Ah, wait, I just wanted to say something. I, I am in the module of Cambalache, the workshop. So if you have been participating or will participate in that model, model I am part of that model. So we are going to be able to know each other much more and talk about the di dynamics. But now Chepis is going to continue uh, to talk to you about, about Cambalache in more... Uh, in a deeper way. So if you remember, have a question, you can put them there in the chat and then we can start doing this session a little bit more dynamic no? with, or interactive with the questions you put in. So thank you so much. So now I'm going to welcome Chepis. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good night. My name is Josefa Vázquez Martínez. I am a uh, Sotzil indigenous from Benistanio Carranza, Chiapas. I was born there. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this, to this sharing. I want to talk to you about the project of Cambalache. It is a project that is, is a project that has no money. Here we only do uh, exchange of things, uh, mutual support and knowledge. Here in this space, we do exchanges that have to do uh, with things and the workshops. Uh, workshops that have to do with a lot of um, subjects, like we could do chocolates, uh, ecological, uh, uh, well, uh, ecological products. Uh, so the people that come here to offer their knowledge, they specify what they want in exchange for those workshops. Maybe, uh, maybe they want some food or they want some things or even from baby clothes. People do their workshop and receive these things in exchange. Right now, we are starting uh, workshops with young people that my daughter, uh, that's 14 years old, is organizing with other uh, young women her age. We, there's a little time that this these workshops had started. Workshops for our young people, they say that they understand more be, uh, with themselves, among, them, among themselves. So here in practice, we have we have uh, space here behind us. It's a place of transit where you bring things, people bring things, and then people start exchanging. Uh, things come, things go, and, and then we have a WhatsApp group, a WhatsApp group that their people do their own exchanges between themselves or amongst themselves. They put, they, they uh, do exchanges that, that have been even bigger because here, uh, uh, their exchanges are food or clothing, but in that WhatsApp, people exchange even furniture, things that are bigger, that they they do those exchanges and don't have to come through Cambalache the, as a space. So here in the pandemia, what is what is happening is that there have been a lot of exchanges for services and food because of lack of resources. Uh, people have used this this these these medium to have uh, fooding. So, we do. So, 
What we want to do in Cambalache is, uh, besides the exchange of things, we, we also say exchange one uh, exchange. Like it's a changing of, of oneself as of the thought, of the thought that capitalism has put us. Uh, inside of everybody like I want I want I want and that generates a lot of other things it generates uh, garbage I, I want I buy the new the new cell phone and that starts to generate a lot of garbage so one of the things that we want in Cambalache is to reuse uh, give a second life to all of the things so that is why we accept exchanges of clothing and, and shoes uh, electronics apparatus and give them a second life so so no so garbage isn't being generated we also want to put that part to for this global warming that is that is global uh to to start diminishing maybe just in this so this is why doing more exchanges is important to make more conscious that we, that we do not need the newest uh, apparatus or the newest cell phone. We don't need to have a car and a house when we can share with others. The important thing for us is to share, to value people. Think that the capital system does not does not value we are all disposable so for us it is to value that everybody has something to give to say i can exchange a laptop for a service uh, that maybe someone can come and help me uh, put things together here in the space or go to support somebody else so another thing that is happening a lot here in San Cristobal because of this this situation right now uh, there's a lot of floodings it's raining a lot and we are doing people we, we are putting together food and clothing to, to support people that are having problems with the floodings and that is part of the idea of supporting the community we do a lot of things and what we want to reflect in this workshop that we're doing right now is to inspire people that to do these things in practice, that in practice it can be done. We are doing it ourselves. So it is possible that all other people do do this. So this is what we want to, to transmit to you, that it is, it is possible to be done. So thank you very much. Um, hello everyone, my name is Erin Araujo and um, really exciting for us to have you here. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. uh, <laughs> so you might hear a little bit of background noise while I'm speaking because we have a uh, hurricane Iota in C on top of us uh, right now or some of the weather that's being generated by this hurricane. And actually, um, the person that speaks after me, Tito, uh, has been having major problems with uh, flooding in his house. And so um, you have to bear with us a little in that the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the physical environment that we're in is in a constantly shifting state. Um, so, uh, so as I was saying, my name is Erin Arajo, and I'm one of the founders and generators of El Cambalache. And it's a great pleasure to share some of this work uh, with us, with you. As you've seen uh, in El Cambalache, we believe in having a harmony of voices and having uh, all every single person in the collective that can participate and, and having them participate as, and give their perspective about what decolonial methods are for us. So the decolonial methods project, I'm gonna read this so, just so that um, bear with me. <laughs> the Decolonial Methods Project in El is an inclusive proposal that encompasses the production of methods to dismantle cap capitalism and generate theories that then guide future practice. We practice subjectivities that are distinct from those generated and imposed within capitalism, which is the foundation of modernity and coloniality. Our decolonial methods reflect our decolonial methods 
reflect the desire to and need to revive and create economic practices, networks, and communities that reconfigure notions of wealth, value, knowledge, and skills by incorporating non-Western ways of knowing and being. As an example of our work, when Okamba Lecture was founded, we decided that the project would include moneyless exchanges because the project promotes the well-being of women. We decided that we would create wealth by focusing on women's non-capitalist activities, and in particular, indigenous women, women in racialized bodies, dissident genders, and all the people who have little access to money would become wealthy in our economy, not as an act of charity, but because there's a multidimensional rainbow of knowledge and skills that are not valued in the capitalist modern colonial system, but are essential to the well-being of everyone and our survival in general. After we began these practices of moneyless exchanges, where everything has the same value, the project quickly began to work because, in Chia because Chiapas and many, many other parts of the Americas are filled with moneyless, are full of moneyless economies that are based on practices that have been created over centuries and sometimes over millennia, alongside, in spite of, and clandestinely, clandestinely in the face of economies of slavery mercantilism, and the other phases, various other phases of capitalism. These are economies of resistance and economies of everyday life. It is for this reason that we say that decolonial practices are rooted in the places where they are created. The practices of an economy without money in Chiapas are, woven, are interwoven in all forms of well-being, through the, though these practices are often not recognized or valued as economic activities. Economic decoloniality requires delving into the spaces that are obfuscated by capitalism, modernity, and coloniality. For people who have been denied access to resources such as money, property, their own bodies, moneyless economies have flourished as diverse family, social, and community practices that have ensured well-being that would not have otherwise existed. These relationships of sharing, working, caring, teaching, and giving have fought for parity. Moneyless networks and practices have not only existed among people who have less access to money and collaterally, uh, have and collaterally have access to social power in a capitalist system, but as researchers from diverse economies have made explicit to us, capitalism is only one type of economic practice among many. In the majority world, we have historically and contemporarily been part of the systematic denial of equal access to money in a capitalist economic system. However, it is also important to remember that economic practices without money do not mean that people do not want access to money or an equal share in access to well-being. However, the structures of coloniality, modernity, and capitalism as a project in itself is a system of exploitation that requires inequality and suffering for all people who are not highly placed in the socioeconomic hierarchy. Racialization, narrow definitions of gender and ability, and the limit limitations inherent in what is recognized as the history and knowledge, and the remuneration of people according to where they're placed in this hierarchy, in order to have access to social power, are the tools of modern colonial and capitalist systems. On the other hand, if a system existed they recognize the great value of the relationships, practices, and networks that create well-being and re resist precarity through remuneration, we could imagine a very different distri distribution of wealth than that which exists today. That is why we are urged right now to recover historical practices and create ec new economic practices to act in the present and in the future to generate economic communities that value the resources we have in abundance, such as knowing how to care, feed, love, laugh, respect, innovate, and create, just to begin with. Decolonial methods can be imagined as practices in synesthesia with polyphonic melodies. That is to say, synesthesia implies that the senses perceive more than their typical function and polyphony re recognizes the persistence of the fullness of melodies that exist at the same time and complement each other to build a harmony. As a concrete example of method with polyphonic synesthesia, we can return to an economy of and for women 
that is not guided by the use of money or the valorization that the capitalist system imposes on them. In a plenitude of skills that make potenti, or the collective heart that exists among us all, it is not just one type of knowledge or one practice that creates well-being. Rather, we can feed and savor a diversity of knowledge, perspectives, and practices that embrace all that exists beyond capitalism, coloniality, and modernity. And these practices are the majority of the knowledge in the world. It is up to us and everyone we know to create the changes necessary in our daily lives, even if those acts are incremental and might seem insignificant. La Tambalatra started as one person, then two, then six. Now we have had 10 Kambalacheras. We have two members that are specifically part of the De Department of Decolonial Economics. Hundreds of people that participate in our online and present and uh, workshops in person and thousands of people that exchange with us every year. We started here in Chiapas and you can start where you are. Let's create change together. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope that you all can hear me. Can someone just say yes to see if I'm not talking by myself? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So, um, well, I'm talking to you right now, watching the river get getting bigger and bigger. So, one of the main experience that I have been, that I have since I live in Chiapas is the constant vulnerability of people here. Um, so my, it's a complicated moment, uh, but it's a, still it's a good challenge because we have been suffering like earthquake, hurricanes, floating, pandemia, capitalism, <laughs> so many things together. But anyway, I feel like coming back to Cambalache and start getting along with the Cambalacheras and with this beautiful project has taught me to like go deeper and deeper um, and, and, and start thinking about techniques and tools and uh, genealogies of Afro-diasporic people who came before me and, and see how, the, um, how, how, how many networks and how much is important networks in, the, in this process of resistance to capitalism. So uh, in this workshop, I present um, a mini workshop that is about his, uh, it's a historical perspective of how to go into different types of archive and, and look deeply what things we can use as um, decolonial tools from an afro diasporic and queer perspective. So for me, it's very, um, it's very important also as a historian, as an activist, as, um, as a black person in the southeast of Chiapas, to rethink history very critically in a way that I can, um, how can I say, solve networks with all the folks and try from a very different um, genealogy to resist this capitalism uh, system. So I, my name is Tito and I, am a, I have a PhD in feminist uh, studies um, also I am a black, queer, and transmasculine, non-binary fem uh, feminist and activist. And I live in Chiapas since 2015. And Cambalache is like the first project that holds me. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, it's a beautiful space. It's a beautiful project. But more than beautiful, it's a very potent and un anti-capitalist proposal because uh, we are all different. Uh, I feel like we have very good intersection, how can I say, very radical intersectional practice of solidarity, of mutual aid, of uh, 
uh, response to catastrophes like what we are living right now. So I hopefully, um, and, and when Erin calls me to share some of the reflections that I was having and that I am still having, with the Kambalashe project, I accept right away because it's like, this is seguro, vamos para allá. So I was very, I was very excited. I am still very excited for being part of this project and to be part also of the, the colonial economics department. So even though feminism is my area of expertise and for the historical um, history and the Black Atlantic and the Queer Atlantic, um, I, w I was very excited to participate in this because it pushed me to think critically, even though as I'm a black a subject in the global south, how we all participate in the uh, construction and the so, um, maintaining of capitalism. It's, it, especially me as a black, uh, black trans person coming from Cuba, my, uh, the Kambalashe challenged my own ideas of consumption, uh, merchandise, the value of money, the value of uh, networking. So I try, I, in my mini workshop, I try to think critically history from a decolonial perspective. I try to use Afro-Caribbean theory, uh, Afro-Caribbean radical thought as uh, Edward Glissant and the plantation system uh, the theories of plantation también, black queer feminism, to think and to look for tools of my ancestors and our ancestors, like black people, um, use to resist and to survive to this um, neocolonialism neo neo era. And first the colonialism and now the neocolonialism. So I invite all of you and I hope that we can keep uh, being in contact. And um, I hope that you really enjoyed the workshop. Uh, as you have seen so far, it's very, um, how can I say? Collective, it's a very, co it's, a, it's a collective effort from very different standpoints that come together. So, well, I have, I just want to invite you to come and keep seating with us. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you soon. Hi, everybody. I am Belkis. I wish from my heart to your heart a very good time for all of you. I am from Venezuela. I am part of Cambalache and of the Department of Decolonial Economies of Cambalache. I want to share today with some reflections that have my, my living with or working with um, the, that I had in my country with uh, with parties the with indigenous women or with um, the, the knowledge of peasants and women indigenous women has been their knowledge has been persecuted from the colonization to nowadays it has been a, a continuous of historical of historical condition and a sustained epistemicide that has that is is still here right now um, an example of this is in the treatment that the midwives, the traditional midwives, have uh, uh, how they treat them. And they do not recognize their work and they, they want to be assimilated and want to be forgotten of their ancestral practices the, um, in their knowledge that have they had have been having the in a historical condition uh, with children and women of their communities during the process of of, of pregnancies and and birth the hegemonic power is one that decides 
over the health of people who can be agents of health, how they should act to, to have that agency. It does not imply in any way the knowledges, the diverse knowledges that coexist in spaces, in diverse spaces with diverse, diverse cultures. So, uh, notion of body is imposed as a notion of history, a notion of medicine, a notion of economy, etc. In this way, in this manner, a, a body is a body here and in all parts of the world. So that that body only needs one one way of looking, one way of seeing, a same way of being treated, and a lot of way of mistreating. The body of the woman and the reproductive process suffers the same destiny through this hegemonic uh, gaze. Why this uh, blind, uh, continuous way of doing? This is a, a key point that shows the efficiency of the midwives and their practices to the way they attend uh, birthhood in context of communities, of rural communities in general. Uh, the bodies of the women that are, that are pregnant, it's not only a body, it's a body in community, body in, in action to bring life to the community that is not only a community of people, of human people, it's a vinculation with other, other beings that form the community body, mountains, animals, rivers, etc. There is a connection with the everything. What that implies is that there is a consciousness that the harmony is health, health of the person, of the people, of the communities, and also the imbalance is is sickness. So the midwife, the traditional midwife, doesn't see women as uh, uh, someone that is sick or someone that is a patient that is there waiting. On the contrary. The, the midwife, the, the woman that is pregnant, has the opportunity to be active in their own uh, child bringing, how to bring those that child to the world, uh, in which way and by whom she wants to be accompanied, accompanied by. Sometimes there's not only the midwife there, uh, the, the husband is sometimes there, or the mother or a uh, sister. Uh, the family accompanies this process because the birth giving is generally in the house of the community so that uh, the woman feels completely accompanied by the family and she is supported. There is a clear conscious that giving birth is a very delicate moment in life, a very dangerous moment in life, but the relationship of confidence uh, of the knowledge of the midwife and the taking care that she has to for the woman, the treatment of spirituality and of the body that the uh, midwives and the woman has that is giving birth makes it um, makes up a place of uh, confidence of tranquility that permits in almost every case a very successful child giving in venezuela for example the midwives is not only occupying in the moment of the child the bringing child to life but it's the one she's the one that can do the rituals that are necessary for the mother and the child to be protected from the external influences human influences or other supernatural uh, bodies that can damage the bodies and lives of the mother or of the child and of the community as well so not only this she is the one that also realizes the rituals that for in the future the child can be a child that that is loved uh, with the mother and the territory the child lives in. So values, knowledges, and useful like midwives, traditional midwives, are, are disadvantaged by our capitalist system because they because they do not want the, the, the horizontal articulation between knowledges and practices that, that are in both medical systems that it would be probably very beneficial for the one being of the women and would avoid so much deaths, uh, mothers that die giving birth. And that would also be important for the, the same economic system in terms of, of health if we see it in the perspective of the capitalist system. It would avoid the institutions 
to put money in political policies of help that states do and that do not that do not help the communities a lot because in communities even though right now money is being used for different transactions the existence of other ki kind of exchange that has another value exists where money is not the value that is being exchanged, it's not fundamental, and it's not even what is what is desirable all the time, and it's not even the efficient way of exchange many times. So this is what I wanted to share. Thank you very much. Great. Hi, welcome to everybody. My name is Aldo Santiago. I was born in Mexico, Mexico City. And during the last years, I have been working as a journalist, independent journalist. And this is from this field of work that I want to share with you today. I have been working in in alternative communication media, independent media, like a way of forming part or or putting tools, communication tools in different processes and collectives, organizations and communities, indigenous uh, farm workers, Afro descendants, for the defense of the territory and the earth. Uh, nowadays, I am I collaborate with a collective that, of, of news that is called Avispa Media. You can look it up, avispa.org. There is very important journalistic information there. Uh, in this work, we I want to talk a little bit about what Belkis was saying in the historical part because we work with with the stories uh, not only we, we're not only working with stories but they are important part so we can reappropriate uh, that tools of communication that has been dispossessed uh, and we, that help that make that knowledges and and information be completely disappeared and other alternative to the capitalistic system are being silenced so that is why the stories are so important so what i wanted to to talk about what belki says about the epistemicide and uh, uh, that that is being made that has a consequences to want to impose a capitalistic vision and nowadays people that that we have an influence of this hege hegemony uh, economy can resound as as uh, equal to, to capitalism but economy is something completely different and the majority world and much a lot of other economies there's a lot of other economies that are economies that are diverse uh, according to geographies and territories uh, that people live in. This economic capitalistic system has been possible during the last uh, decades and centuries. And more recently, with all this exploitation of nature, um, with extractivism and abuse of fossil fuels. And this, this uh, raw product has made us think that the development is existing and that there is progress and economic development. And this idea can continue uh, to, from here to, to every day, that every day we're going to have more development, more progress, more richness as we be exploiting nature, and then we're going to have more progress and more money. Uh, so we are part and we are witnesses of the consequences of what this bringing to us. Right now, you, the, my compañeras has said, the, the hurricane is not a uh, minor think it's very preoccupied and because here in San Cristobal uh, we are not in we are not in the beach we ha but we are having these consequences of the rain and these climate changes that are so so great and that we have floodings that we have more uh, displacement and more poverty so the climate change has a root that is this abuse of the fossil fuels that and consolidates the capitalistic system so uh, and they are conscious of this so they have tried for decades as what i have studied 
uh, three decades have four decades more or less where they have started to re uh, green capitalism so this is the idea of green economy comes about the green economy is appropriation of the ecological discourse for those who are responsible for the ecological situation. So the people that are extracting minerals, the, the, the projects that are uh, taking the rivers away, the, the monocultives, um, that is dispossessing communities uh, from their from their territory to be able to reconvert the resource in, uh, in in green energy supposedly so these people that are causing this devastation are the ones that are putting this discourse now i have been last four years trying to in, uh, and, and, uh, know what's happening what, what's happening with these theories and how are these theories are being sold and being able to cope co-optate and uh, this discourse and and disrupt uh, communitary models through their devastation and and make putting in other ways of organizing production into these territories that are devastating so i see it in a very concrete case in the selva la candona where they call it the selva la candona in guatemala in Petén, where we find diverse consequences of the implementation of these green economies, that they merchandise uh, the nature and the earth, and they appropriate resources as water and biodiversity, land, for in the future do other make other corporations, is displacing entire communities. So my, my work is centered in how we can study and analyze these projects that come from institutions, that uh, uh, development agencies, banks of development, uh, states, national, national state, or, or ONGs, NGOs, that want to sell as something nice this discourse that in reality is only perpetrating dispossession. So that is like in a great in uh, general terms what I work with and what I wanted to share with you and what I'm going to share with you from now and on. So thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mayra. I am Cambalachera. I'm a Cambalachera as well. And I wanted to share to you some reflections uh, about consumption, things that we have been sharing uh, amongst ourselves. And we have re been, been rethinking other ways of, of consumption. And what we have seen and talked about is that what is behind consumption? What we do not see in how certain products uh, arrive to, to our life and to share that about our experience and practice. In my case, I, in textile, I, I do clothing. So that's why a lot of questions came about where, where do these things come from? Who produced them? What things? What implications does this have to Mother Earth? Uh, and looking to our past, how did uh, our mothers, our grandmothers uh, uh, come to get fooding and how did they clothe themselves and they started us to think about other historical memories our own roots the knowledges and practices that our ancestors had and how does that relate with that their environment as well uh, practices that we recognize as anti-capitalistic practices in my case for example we are four brothers and sisters the clothes came from generation to generation that are practices completely anti-capitalistic practices of other types of economies that we do not recognize and that we have in front of us. We think that everything is capitalism. But then we start giving another gaze uh, to, the, to the past and start seeing that history and that story and putting it in the present and sharing that history. I remember my grandmother that she had a avocado tree and she shared that with us. So start seeing those dynamics as well 
tu vecino, when tu your neighbor has uh, asked you for something, how is the relationship there? And also, I think that a lot of things that happen in city, in the cities, we don't know who we're buying from. We go to the supermarket, we buy, we leave, and we don't have any conscience or notions at all of who are we buying, what that implies, what is the, the product change. So I want to invite us to, to look at look at ourselves, share how is our uh, present consumption and how from the city we can also uh, in, make networks and we have people that do certain things and, and start doing networks that we know who produce our, our foodings and our clothing and how they do these, these, these products. And also in the defense of the territory, because we are talking about decoloniality, we are not uh, for disposition of the territory. We want reciprocity with the earth that gives us life and we want to take care of earth and life and mother earth. So it's a cycle. So that's the importance of this same collective and organized labor to make life uh, from our roots, uh, from ancestral practices, from our ways and that are, uh, of self-management. Nobody comes here and tells us how we have to organize. We have to do this ourselves. Let's start saying, how can we organize? How do we want to organize? So there has been like a lot of reflections and um, that we have been having here between amongst our, us as compañeras uh, around consumption and from our own experience. So we want to connect more and more with with the land and be more autonomous and cons uh, construct and build relationship networks. Know that we are not isolated individuals that with capitalism proposes that you are alone and that you are, are isolated. So what we're trying to see is that in which way we can start doing this uh, that has, has to do with self-management in networks and how many practices have been lost in cities uh, with, uh, with this idea of progress that, that and we started to look at this and the invitation here is to reflect from our own experiences how can we visualize other types of economies uh, diverse economies and how from the experience of a compañera that, that, that works in Cuctalban, that's that collective that um, uh, produces coffees that are agroecological products and how a lot of families organize themselves and form this cooperative. So this is the invitation to, to gaze and put our, our eyes in this historical memories and we take these practices into our lives in the present. So thank you very much. We're going to give us everybody 10 minutes so we can see these questions on, on the chat. So in a little while, we'll connect uh, again to respond to those questions. So thank you very much. Uh, answer all of us. I'm going to start and then we're going to continue with the sharing. Uh, in terms of how do we share the initiatives uh, of decoding the methods with communities? Okay. <laughs> she needs the question. So we're get, they're going to read the question again? Sí. OK, so Rami's going to start. Uh, respond to the question about how, how we action uh, with this situation of emergency with the floodings. Uh, actually, this action is it doesn't start from Cambalache. A lot of collectives and organizations have taken uh, matters, uh, hands in the matter, and started to organize themselves first from the rescues because there have been a lot of people uh, and houses that have been flooded that lost everything in their homes. So there's a lot of networks of volunteers and and rescuers that are acting in those collectives that are we are supporting from uh, putting in food here in Camalache and then giving them to them because they have been translated to, to houses, community houses, because they don't have uh, clothes or, or jobs because they even lost their jobs. 
and and through these gatherings of, of food or clothes or some necessities that are, are trying to be covered with with this so what we're doing in particular is helping with this gathering of food or of resources here and in other places that we are coordinating with and then we give these these that what we brought together to this voluntary network of rescuers so they can take them to the community. So we could not action alone. So this is like a work job in a network and community in which there is a disinterest. It's only solidarity work, thinking about uh, people that have been affected by these, by these floodings. So that is responding to the floodings. Another way that, that Camalache has worked is like in this WhatsApp group because a lot of people that have also lost their 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 home, home housing and lost their their things, they are are asking donations in this group or exchange. Uh, or this money was exchanged with something that they can give in return, maybe a service they can give and the, the, in another time, but for them to solve right now these material necessities. So in exchange, in this WhatsApp group, there have been uh, beds um, and, and different things that have been exchanged in this WhatsApp group that to cover the necessities that have been things that have been lost through the floodings people that are not cambalacheras uh, because they do not they do not form part of the collective but they are cambalacheras in the sense that they practice this type of economy and it is a very large large group like 300 people are in that whatsapp group here in san cristobal And then the other question is about how we take these met uh, decolonial methods and community methods to, to the, com the larger scale community. I would say that a part of uh, we are we are inside all the time of these decolonial practices because of where we are. So what is Romina was saying and Balthus was saying right now is that part of living here in San Cristobal de las Casas or in Chiapas is that there is a constant work of economy without any money that is being practiced all the time and that is not specified like this. It's not like named this way. So we can say that our our job is not that we teach uh, decolonial methods to people here. It's more like we give them value. And we look how we, we can strengthen these practices and give them some significance through saying this practice is this way of doing these networks, these ways of sharing, these ways of valuing ourselves is decolonial and it's important. And for us, and we that, that gives us value as well because that is why we're acting this way. And so we're in this process that is more like of revaluing valuing in the in, in the sense of creating decolonial methods they are here uh, they are in all of places of the world the things that they are shadowed all the time the decolonial practices the reason why it's called decolonial is because there is a, a paradigm that is that is the the one that is dominating and so what we have to do is visualize those other practices Camalache has a lot of people that is uh, participating constantly because they feel uh, important and that there is a value that is giving to something that they, they they feel as emotional labor but when you do it in community in a lot with a lot of people and we value those practices then the, the, the weight is lifted, the emotional weight is lifted, uh, the weight about taking care of is, is, is lifted because it's something that is valued and recognized as a, as a good. I would like to also add that 
that we, like Erin said, it's not that we teach methods or decolonial practices. We directly uh, do this in our daily lives. And a way that I see that, yeah, that is like giving, uh, like fighting capitalism is this of sharing knowledge is because a lot of the workshops are around exchange. There is no money uh, in, in between. And the structure is being broken in which one does not know anything or that somebody to know, that to feel that they know or to feel the, the security that they know something, they need a title or a university title. So a lot of people come here to share their knowledge that are not, maybe uh, they don't have a university title, but when they feel that other people need those knowledges, they give value of those knowledges that they have. Um, that sharing, so uh, that's in that disinterest of, of the knowledge, I think that is something very important that we have to recover and not as like putting like this, this knowledge only for people that can pay for it. Here, there's also a reality that there's not so much access to money and education and the access to education is, is very easy. This that if somebody can share these knowledges and, and the, it, it's very important and necessary in these contexts and these, in these communities. And also there is a strengthening of, of the relationship between people. And you learn in another way, like more community way, like we learn in a more communal way, communal way. What we were saying about the practices of the Camaleche is not something that is new. The compañera said it. It is a practices, a central practices in the communities themselves uh, from the, which I come from. And I can say about those practices, they, there's a lot of practices. There's a form of life, a way of living of those communities. Uh, people have never had access to money like in cities in the communities there's exchanges of things of, of food somebody has beans so they has corn and they do these exchanges or they went to the tianguis that's how they are called in in our times they were called differently but somebody had fruits or vegetables in their communities and they exchanged for others that they didn't have in their communities. Here in Chiapas, the, the climate is very, very diverse. So that gives the possibility that some communities has to plant some things and the other communities have other things. So when they do the exchange, it's a form of life for the communities. So it's that, it's not that we are inventing anything. It's a way of living of the same communities uh, that we are visible, making them visible in the practice here in the city. I would like to uh, add uh, to what Marina was saying is that how, how things that we know how, know how to do is valued or not. For me, this happened as well. I forgot what I knew how to do. I forgot that I knew that to do, how to do a lot of things because I stopped doing them for a lot of years because I was in a work that I had a payment and, and a salary and that life, um, and that doing something else to making money took me to forget that uh, to know how to make a bed, to know how uh, is something that is very useful and important but the system has made us see that that is doesn't 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 have value that if we know how to cook without being the chef uh, to just know how to cook um, to make the some beans very delicious beans or doing some tortillas or arepas from Venezuela or these uh, food this is not that that is also a very important knowledge that is not valued I really love to celebrate with here in Camalache and to my compas they, they love that I bring arepas that I do that I make that I make and I bring them to them they love it and they value it so much and I feel very valued in in my knowledge and in my uh, and recognize myself as Venezolana and Andina that that I am not the, the, the best one that does arepas in the Los Andes but 
but my compañeras recognize this work. They like how they taste. Uh, so, so it's also recognizing ourselves in what we know how to do that maybe seems little, but it's not little in reality. So here in Cambalache, I have learned to revalue a lot of those little things that I thought that that weren't so important or didn't have so much value. So somebody helped with, with I don't know, with the food, with the food and the house for everybody to sleep and eat. But no, that. That is not just that. It is important. Does it have value? If I make the bed well to, for my for my child to sleep there, he's gonna sleep well and he's gonna have a good night's sleep, and that has a very very big value. So we're gonna read the second question, and the second question is: I'd like to know how you reflect on the contradictions of being embedded in the capitalist system through modes of consumption while resisting it. Do you think or hope to be fully autonomous? And what's your take on autonomy then? In Spanish. Okay, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a question that we receive a lot and for us it's not necessarily so much vinculated or to our work even though it may seem so for us the idea being in a moneyless economy or generate uh, generate an economy without money, a moneyless economy. Uh, it, like it doesn't, for us, it doesn't have a contradiction of being, generate this economy and being in this econ capitalist economy. Uh, for us, yeah, there's no contradiction there because we are in a situation where we uh, have, uh, we are imposed to this capitalist economy and that we are, are forced to pay rent, to force to pay light, uh, forced to pay the Zoom, um, and to pay a, a lot of things. We live in a situation and in a city, even though it's, it's little, we have 205,000 people in the city. Uh, so to feed ourselves, to take care of ourselves with uh, medical services, uh, even though we try a lot of ways to avoid to pay for things or or diminish to diminish our our dependence on money to make it as less as possible this dependence because all of those things require money. But in all of the possible things in which we do not need to spend money for us, that gives us more access to have more control over our time and to better our, uh, our quality of life. So here in San Cristobal and in the majority world, for, because of historical conditions and systemic conditions, because of the colonial uh, modern coin, uh, capital system, we have been denied access to money. For us, here in San Cristobal, the minimal wage in the tourist area is it's like, it's like five or six dollars a day. It is nothing it's to have access to, to a li uh, one liter of gas gasoline is one dollar. So we are in a situation in which we don't have access to money. We have a minimal access for to money. So to be able to use it, we don't have like much luxury to do so. It, it doesn't give us a contradiction. So why are we consuming so much? It's more like we look ways to have a well-being, even though we don't have money. That is what we're looking for. And the, no, what's um, autonomy depends on how each okay. one of us, uh, how everybody defines autonomy. Here, autonomy has a lot of definitions. One of those definitions 
is to form a community that takes care of each other in this community. So that's a way uh, of uh, understanding autonomy here. And in other parts of Latin America is that you form networks and those networks take care of each other uh, in this bigger network. So we do wanna be autonomous. That is our, our, our job, that is our labor, that is. That is the, the point of the situation that we want to be autonomous. So to know when we are autonom autonomous, I don't think that it's something that you can measure exactly. Like today we are autonomous or tomorrow we're gonna be autonomous or we are always in in, like in degrees of, of being autonomous. And, or, and also in degrees we are part of the, the capitalist system all the time in certain degrees. A little bit what uh, Erin was saying, and what we try to do here, the majority that we that are here in Camalache is that we work in collectives uh, with other people that are, that, that think like, uh, that do not make us force us to, to make certain uh, schedules. There are people that here that do their own projects in an artisanal manner to be able to, to sell them and have a little bit of money. I, in my case, work with other people that are not necessarily the, the, the boss and the money that's, that's, we have more access that maybe you have a situation, a personal situation. You can have that possibility of, of moving. If you have an emergency, you can go and do that emergency. There are jobs that are so inside this capitalist system that they don't give you this option. You have to have this schedule and even what happens, what happens, you have to do this schedule. And in this case, we try to look for jobs that do not uh, exploit you so much because we have family. We are single mothers as well here that we have to be in the care of our daughters and our sons with a flexible time so we can be with our daughters. And in this case, what Erin said, um, we try to diminish uh, to the dependence on money. Yeah, I have uh, a little girl that's four years old. That three years, they, I didn't have to buy her any clothing, only underwear. Because in this same system in which we are, we could have this possibility that if people know that you're in this, that you don't care, that it's not important for you if you use uh, clothing that somebody else has used. My daughter uh, grew up with this, but they changed clothes. Uh, three years is a lot for somebody that lives in the city. So that helps you to, to, to diminish this, this use of money. And that money, that little money that comes into the house, you can use it on other things. So these kind of things start uh, helping us to give our times as well for other things in, in other manners. I wanted to add that, yeah, that from the personal standpoint, I have been in many stages in relationships with money and certain moments I would like want to, to like uh, give up on money and not being able to do so, I was so angry and all of these frustrations, but in sometimes Although when I came to San Cristobal, I also saw that that uh, being angry and frustrated to be because I cannot like let go of all the money, it was like it's completely impossible. So the way that I found, and I think that that is why we are all here, is like uh, in my personal life, I use these methods and practices because and because I was born in Latin America with free access to money. In our personal life, we use these ways uh, of obtaining what we have without money. Uh, we, we, we get what we need with other practices. So here, like the most important was to visualize those practices, dignify those practices, and reproduce these practices. So I found in that path without uh, renouncing uh, to money at all because I do have to pay rent. Um, it is like what the, what I mostly use money for, uh, paying rent. But 
the constructing a building I would say I have doors as well, and I, I see everything much as well, the, the construction and the building of what I am leaving, not only for myself, but for the generations to come, uh, to take down capitalism. And, and to obtain autonomy is very really a long, long path. It's not something it's like right now. It's come from a long time before, and it's going to continue before after us. I'm sorry. So uh, in regards to autonomy, I think that autonomy is a very, very long path. And that and we try to be the more more autonomous, autonomous we can. And it's not only the autonomy that the, the people say like of the project, uh, but autonomy in our own lives, uh, of, of having our own vegetables, uh, questioning our education and looking for alternatives, uh, questioning medicine and searching alternatives, knowing the, the plants, the traditional medicine, to making our own, our own medicines as well and of sharing those knowledges as well. And autonomy is that as well, no? to strengthen ourselves as a community for our well-being in a way that is respectful with the environment and with our, the people that surround us. So autonomy is a process that is not individual. It could come from the individual, but it's collective. And it's very, very long. And it also varies a lot and, and changes and is relative. Um, and well, if that's it. La siguiente pregunta. Okay, I'm going to read the next question now. <laughs> the next question is, my question would be whether you had any ideas or reflections about how one might transition from projects that require some sort of monetary exchanges at the onset towards moneyless projects. Perhaps the question is easier with an example. I research community-led initiatives to produce renewable energy for their own use. And the challenge is that to become self-sufficient by acquiring off-grid energy, uh, for example, biogas, digester, solar panels, small hydro turbines, community groups are often uh, brought into relations of debt to be able to buy these systems in the first place. Some collectives have created community savings groups to avoid relying on banks and other financial institutions. I don't know if you face similar challenges in some of your projects. ¿Quieres que la traduzca? Ah, ya. Pero para ti. Es que está para todos, pues sí. Sí. O sea, hablen un poquito y yo también puedo entrar en ejemplo. Sí, porque habla mucho de lo que tú decías. Okay, so for so transition to economy that that are pro that with our products that require money as energy to products that 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 are moneyless. It is not something that that is going to be a recipe for. But one can think that if through processes of organization, social organization, <laughs> and mobilization to take the means of production. Uh, uh, such as what social movements have done to, to, to uh, fight for access to energy as a human right. So we can think of in ways like, like alternative ways or bigger ways to work uh, questions like that of energy. But in that specific example, who has worked more about this is Aldo that knows a lot of projects that do that. Uh, so I, I, I would like to like try to put this like little uh, I don't want to say what Erin has, has said but it's something that is very important there's not a recipe that is for sure uh, but what do exist are experiences that we know about 
uh, and we have met, I can talk to you about uh, experience in specific that maybe can connect with this scenario that you were putting. In 2017 and 2018, at this Familia, we created a project, of in, uh, an investigation project that we called a colonialism uh, to, to put ecologism with colonialism together. So that is what we're talking about the discourse of the Bruno economy. So e colonialism, we made an investigation uh, about mega hydroelectricals that had came with this uh, discourse of clean energy uh, to displace people and create destruction. In that the, in the investigation we made, we go into Honduras in the Atlantic coast. Of Honduras, there's a community that we that we met that was called Plan Grande. It is a community that is upper descendant and that is marginalized completely from the electric uh, electricity. Uh, you cannot get there by by road. You have to go with with a sh with uh, with ships, there's like a uh, coast, and that community lived without energy, with electrical energy, without any electrical energy. So they found a turbine, and the starting of the project was was supported by an agency of development. I don't know if it's Spain. Uh, the difference that they they got is that they didn't let that the project came to be implemented with all of the parameters of the external group. In that case this institution, this financial institution, but they appropriate themselves of the management of all of the system. And they have gave, given a leap, a very important leap uh, to, to, to make a difference between how they can obtain a little bit of autonomy. So what they were talking about to, to make their, they generate their own energy for their own consumption and benefit. And the key there has been that there are commissions uh, who are gave, give, to giving maintenance to the equipment and to supervise their are, are quotas that people have, uh, depending on the access money that people have, because it is a money, it is a place that there's a lot of access to money. And even they started to expand. Uh, it is not only uh, something that is about the production and consumption of energy, with that money that they started to, to get with this with this producing energy, they gave they gave scholarships for their daughters and sons that are in school that need uh, material for for the books or or food or whatever. So this example is very specific. It comes to mind with this question that is very a long long history of this. You can con you can look in avispa.org to see this example. I don't know if it's translated or not because we try to maintain publications in Spanish and in English and Portuguese, but I'm not sure if this one is translated or not. I think it is. Uh, so Avispa Media, you can look Plan Grande, uh, an hydroelectrical for autonomy. So that it would be the, the example I could give right now. Thank you. See, so uh, we'll read the next question. Hi. Hi. La tres o la... When we're talking about decolonial methods uh, historically, eh, leo en español, pero, cuando se trata de métodos de coloniales en lo histórico, es de mirar hacia el pasado y a la memoria histórica. Cuando se Cuando se trata de métodos de coloniales en lo histórico, es de mirar hacia el pasado y la memoria histórica. So in English, it would be like when we're talking about decolonial methods histor in, in the history, are we talking about gazing to the past and to historical memory? Okay, so oh, uh, looking at the past and reconstructing historical memory, uh, it's, it's a tool. It's a tool that, that can be absolutely decolonial or not. 
depending how we use it and for what we use it. So one of the things that we have worked is the reconstructing of how uh, at, in, in history from the colonial period to right now, uh, the, how the invisibilization, invisibilization and the erasement of the knowledge of women, how has this have come about from the, for, for that we have revised different historical documents, but the, the hard data, uh, what we see there is that we have to complement them and, and confront them with what, I don't know, maybe the archaeology tells us, uh, what happens with what archaeology tells us, or the repressural art tells us, uh, what they can read in the images of the, of the stone walls, what they read there, but also, and well, of course, what anthropology and the analogy says, but as well, and very fundamentally, what people has have in their memory, what they have in their their oral memory, historical oral memory, or their oral memory in general. So what do, this, what do people remember and what do they maintain? What do they maintain in their in their practice, in their everyday practice of living the history, the story of the past? And not, and how that history of the past served in the present to do things. For example, I don't know. Uh, example that comes to mind is how do how does the indigenous people uh, like I don't know the indigenous people that have lost apparently their identity that they were like farmed uh, their farmers eyes and they lost this indigenous um, identities and how in the actuality in nowadays they are putting that identities back again as a way of recovering uh, this and how are they doing this recovery of their own indigenous identity is by the memory uh, a lot of these people they they propose to do this and they recover the knowledges and the historical memory that the the elders have and keep uh, to be able to have a knowledge of a uh, base uh, in the in actionings of the to to ask for the rights that the people deserve so that can be an example Ah, and it is going to respond. Okay. Um, bueno, a mí me gustaría para eh, comenzar a responder esta pregunta, eh, pues leerles eh, una definición de descolonización. Of decolonization. De eh, una profesora afro-brasileña llamada Denise Afro Ferreira de la Silva. De Silva. Uh, Tito, can you speak in English? Eh, ella dice, descolonizas. Ah, ok, sí, sí. Gracias. Yeah, yeah. Sí, sí, no te preocupes. So, to start answering this question, I would like to start talking about a definition that the afro brazilian professor who's living currently in Canada, and she said, decolonization is the full restoration of the value of the total value expropriated from the work of enslaved pe African enslaved people and the indigenous land. So, I mean, I really love her work, and um, for me, um, her definition triggers me to to build in collaboration with the people from Camalache through through this idea. No, and um, I think history, I think two two things coming from this uh, coming from this definition of decolonization. First, what is history? And second, what are the purpose for, of history? No, so history is a is a narrative that sustain the white morality of the world. No, uh, having in mind that history has been, um, how can I say, a, a field of research uh, mostly 
predominantly Y and um, and yeah, predominantly for of Y cis male uh, or or Y cis male gays, no. So for for me as a historian, as a, as a feminist and uh, as a trans person, I feel like um, history and or as a had Sadia Harman puts like use the archive with imagine with a black queer radical imagination can help us to narrate other histories but you know like the colonial studies always said like other thoughts or otros saberes like in that otherness i feel like keeps keeps pushing us uh, i mean the majority of um, black and indigenous people from the world in this category of, of the others. So for me, the first thing that the colonial perspective need to do is to stop this continuation of otherness, no? And and that is why history is, so, is such a good, um, how can I say, use of, uh, re, of retwisting and remaking history because it helps us uh, to look forward in um, in this archive of other history, as Belkis previously said, in archive of uh, of our grandmothers, of our neighbors that are here, you know, to rethink and in 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 their history, see and look forward, look for sorry this. Uh, archives of experience of survival. But for that, we need to do first is try, how can we look for something if we don't know what it is? And second, how is this, uh, as Gloria Durker puts, how this white innocence play role in these uh, processes of researching, of looking and going through history? Because for what many people is uh, something called illegal or criminal for a lot of black people, is the way that we do, the way that we survive, and the way that we survive in order to how this why colonial system has made us to to engage with it. No, so another thing that we need to look have in mind when we are in this process of researching or trying to decolonize, decolonizing history is the more um, our own perspective and how our own perspective of research is embedded in this white colonial morality. So if we try to engage fully with um, communities of people, how Cambalache and other collective and other communities that are doing a very, dis uh, different job from the mainstream um i uh, from the mainstream fields of research of even the coloniality we can start like how can i say we can start switching our minds in a in a way that this white morality start losing weight in our mind in our thoughts and so so it's not just to go to the archive and look what um black and indigenous people did in the past, we also need to change our uh, place of enunciation. And and that is not a, a, a process that we're gonna do a reading a book or reading 10 books or going to a course of decolonization. It's just a process of political commitment to our communities, you know? So that's, it's, that's part of this, uh, process of uh, of the colonizing history is the veil where that doesn't allow us to look um, in a radical way and another thing that I want to say is that why Sadia Harman said about that if we want to look if we want if we want to go into the archive and to look the history or recreating history of black and queer people, on, uh, uh, we need imagination because even the imagination is colonized. And this is, um, I'm using the words of Daniel Sepulveda, he's an independent scholar from Mexico. 
and this idea that even the imagination is 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 colonized it helped it seems like it is not important when we think about economies but it is because if our mind is so perpetrated of this colonial conception of how it, of um, the main role that money plays within the the isolation the the, the process of isolation of the capitalism put on us um this uh, egocentrism or e egotism e egoismo i don't know how to say that but this idea of that i can do it alone uh, it they they are i how can i say these are like ideological structures that the capitalism has contracted in, into our mind into our education into our personalities that doesn't allow us to establish networks, which for me is kind of like one of the main uh, sources to start switching this idea, this economic, this capitalist economic, uh, uh, how can I say, um, I, no, not just ideas, but the way that we uh, practice, the word that I'm trying to look for is practice. So it's, it's a networks um, prioritizing the movement of black and indigenous people, prioritizing um, what we call economies, but also is a, is a much vast world of a human interchange uh, of queer and trans people. This can help us to start switching our own capitalist practices. So history help us in that because history in a Western sense is the past. But the past is here with us. It's going along with us because and, and in this way we can see very easily with in our own communities if we don't live in white bougie neighbors or uh, how the past is still with us and creating and and researching histories of black and indigenous people in a in a in a color in a collati in in collaboration um uh, be civilizing uh, trans and queers histories in collaboration with them or prioritizing them in this process can help us to um, decentralize what we, ha what the colonialism has placed, like what uh, other folks were, were talking about previously. So, I, for me, it's important history, also because with different histories we can start promoting a different sense of world to children and this is very basic no but it's true like i am i'm a passionate for history and i'm i'm a passionate for pedagogies and education so for me if we start teaching histories um different histories that we are teaching still to children we're gonna have different very very different um adults people and that's what we need because Change is not going to come in a generation or two or three. I mean, I'm coming from the Cuban Revolution, so I know what I'm talking about. So it's not going to come maybe um, during our, our own process of growing up or being alive. But we need to start seeding these uh, stories differently. So, well, that's what I want to say. And, well, thank you. <laughs>
um, this last summer. And uh, I thought that I joined with the intention of um, ha uh, th really thinking about life and, and how life should be lived differently. And I was born and raised in Hong Kong, um, which is a former British colony. I went to a British high school um, and most of the teaching was really focused on the British way of thinking. I mean, we were taught in English. History was mostly European history. Um, World War One and Two were taught from the British perspective. And of course, as a teenager, I didn't really notice um, or even realize, you know, what was being done to my education and my, um, my formative years. Um, it was only after going to college that I realized, you know, um, how deeply rooted colonialism is in our world and how colonialism has really changed and shaped um, life not only in the colonies, but obviously around the world. And so, you know, as an adult, um, coming to the realization uh, that, um, coming to the realization that um, colonialism has really shaped the legitimacy of knowledge, especially in, um, in ways that are more noticeable to me was in medicine, um, in language, in education, and also other aspects of life. So I, um, like many people in Hong Kong and Asia, um, I really wanted to get into medical school and obviously medical school was in Western medicine. Um, so noticing that a lot of Hong Kong people revering uh, med school, medical school and, and obviously Western, medica uh, Western medication and medicine, how that has shaped the education system. Um, and, you know, a lot of Western medicine, um, their evidence is based on Europeans, um, studies on white people. And so obviously not always immediately applicable to the rest of the world, especially, you know, Asian bodies, um, black bodies, brown bodies, you know, not necessarily included in a lot of their um, evidence and, and, and building of the Western medicine. And it was very interesting when I spent more time with my aunts who are now 60, 70, um, they were talking about childhood remedies that were used, um, ancient Chinese medicine, and, and obviously Chinese medicine has been around for way longer um, than Western medicine. So it was very interesting to me to um, not only hear more about um, medicine that my own family used to use um, when they were kids, um, but also telling them that, hey, you know, your methods were, were completely legitimate. Um, you know, they work for you and it doesn't have to be costing a lot. It doesn't have to be, you know, backed by Western medicine for, for whatever you are doing to your own body um, to be legitimate. Um, obviously medicine is a very personal um, thing and it's not, there's no, not a set formula that works for everyone. Um, and so I realized, you know, through the, through the workshop with uh, Kambalache, uh, Kambalache and also through my own realization that colonialism really starts when you know, I think and act deeply and critically about the current system and to, to veer away, steer away from the current capitalist system. Um, and also acknowledging and understanding decolonial thoughts really help to give power back to the local people um, and, you know, their, their way of life and their knowledge before um, they were a colony or even as they were evolving um, with, with um, you know, colonial officers or the colonial rule but they were also, you know, living in their, um, living, live, trying to live and, and resist. Um, and so giving power back to uh, that aspect of their life and, and their resistance. Thank you. And thank you, Kambalache. And it was so nice to uh, participate again in, um, with you all and hearing, hearing all of you speak. And thank you, Rosa, for the translation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bowie. Thank you for all of the participants that have been listening and seeing us from where you are in their different uh, times. So we thank you so much. And we cannot respond to all of the questions because of the time. Uh, we have another session next. And there's not much time right now. But I would like to thank you these questions as well. And I would like to, we would like to invite you to participate in the workshop, uh, do your own non-capitalistic economy that ha that is part 
of our self-managed and we have been inviting recently to this workshop and we would like for you to support us also uh, sharing this with your with your compañeras, compañeros, with people in your schools and that, that are, could be interested and wanted to, 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 to come to the practice uh, theory to practice and to know how the practice of decolonial economy is and the practice that we are working and have been working from some time and we have some material that can, we can share that is very important and thank you very very much uh, we would like to invite you uh, to this workshop again if you can't assist you can share with your friends and for this reflection to continue for, for what we have just uh, talked to us about because this is very urgent we said in the beginning that it is very urgent to move and to do something practical to, to shift towards practice and decoloniality cannot be if there is not a real everyday practice our little actions also impact in a uh, long term uh, so I don't have anything else to say but uh, thank you and send you a lot of hugs and we hope we can find each other in the next workshop that is going to start December 15 where we're going to give out the material and videos and a lot of things that we have been working on and in January the virtual sessions are gonna be be having we are gonna be having and we can also share more information uh, in email and if you want to be part of the network and you want to be in our mailing list you can say yes we have your mails and we we can put you in this mailing